columnist with the New Zealand Herald and also somebody who's been involved in the trade game from the engagement side of things, not as a negotiator, but certainly someone who has followed New Zealand's and other people's adventures in the world of trade uh, for a good two decades or more. Uh, this final panel uh, considers how we move forward on trade in turbulent times. And we're privileged to be rejoined for this session by three stellar panellists who have each had a singular lens on the issues affecting the region and indeed the world. And of course, Vangeli Vitalis, domestic, <laughs> but also a stellar panellist. Uh, so there we go. Um, firstly, Alan Gindrell, uh, who's the National President of the Australian Institute of Foreign Affairs. He's had a broad sweep, as you would see from his bio, across foreign affairs, uh, security, and the Lowy Institute. He's also been a keen observer of the New Zealand and Australia relationship over many years, as we've heard earlier. Uh, Deborah Elms, Executive Director and Founder of the Asian Trade Centre in Singapore. Deborah's career covers a very broad sweep, and to those of us who have been engaged in APEC or PEC over the years, she has an outstanding reputation, and I feel quite honoured that you're down here with us over this couple of days, Deborah, and look forward to your uh, comments. Uh, Kristen Bondietta, uh, Program Director, Trade Policy and Research at Australian APEC Study Centre in Melbourne. She also serves on the Secretariat for OSPEC, and has been a great collaborator with New Zealand PEC on a range of projects, as um, both Rob Scolle and Yvonne Lucas could attest, who are from New Zealand PEC and here today. And finally, Vangeli Vitalis, um, deserved reputation himself, has been at the forefront of um, developing regional architecture. And for those of us who know Tim, dear colleague as he is and has been over the years, I think Vangeli also has uh, notched up considerable uh, moves in international architecture, which he could also claim authorship for, mm -hmm. but is probably far too um, careful <laughs> to do so publicly at this stage of his career. Uh, more recently, he uh, chaired the APEC senior officials uh, when we hosted APEC in 2021. He's now chairing the CPTPP uh, commission, officials side of it, and that's a fairly major challenge for New Zealand because not only do we have the potential accession of the UK, uh, over the next few months, but also uh, beating at the door China, Taipei and others, and Costa Rica, as we heard uh, earlier. So this is a really interesting stretch of water to navigate, which I would say would be equally the match of the Australian and uh, New Zealand attempts to get over the Tasman Sea back in the day, 40-odd years ago. And um, also Cyclone Bowler, from an official's perspective, um, got a, um, from a foreign affairs perspective, a lens on that as, as well. So a very interesting uh, panel, and uh, I hope you make the most of it. Uh, we are going to cover uh, a few broad strokes on the issues and then uh, look at one or two more, I guess, uh, thorny um, elements to it. So turbulent times, the geopolitical challenges, they abound. Obviously, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which, as we've heard, has had a huge impact on food security and also energy within Europe. Um, lengthy US-China standoff, which uh, I think Rob Scolle reminded us um, we don't really need more sanctions uh, to come uh, relating uh, to all of that. But however, it is a risk out there. Um, the unpalatable protectionist measures, which have enjoyed currency over the last few years, uh, never um, kind of put so nakedly as to say uh, outright subsidies, always cloaked in uh, very interesting official language, which um, those of you who have worked in the regulatory space in, um, in the re various departments who also have an equal uh, role to play in how trade is... Um, played out, no full well. Um, supply chain disruptions through COVID, stasis at the WTO, the climate impacts, which we heard about today, which are huge and thorny. And, um, and as we've been feeling in New Zealand with the floods and cyclones playing out, these are coming um, onto our own doorstep and you know, evacuations taking place on the East Coast again today. So, you know, a very difficult time where we have to make choices. Yet in this environment, we actually have relatively small nations like New Zealand and Australia, which do play an outside role uh, in keeping the world trade lanes going and also in international affairs and endeavouring to stop you know, the steady march, I guess, towards deglobalisation, which has been occurring. 
So um, I'll start with Alan. Over the past two days, we've heard much about the difficulties the world faces and finds itself in and the pressures on trade. I mean, how do you view these turbulent times and, and what do you really feel we need to be thinking about and doing to get through this? Uh, thanks very much, Fran. It's been a fascinating uh, two days and I'm going to be blunter than, um, than I possibly uh, uh, should be. Uh, look, it's, it's been a really depressing um, uh, two days uh, as well. <laughs> if, you, if you look at uh, all the dimensions of trade, m at the multilateral level, we all agree that the WTO, yeah, um, despite you know, a couple of uh, you know, marginal developments uh, on, on fisheries, is not serving uh, its purpose. At the plurilateral um, uh, um, you know, agreements of, um, of, conven of convenience uh, level, there's some progress some things that you can do, but do they excite you? No, they do not, really. And at the, and at the bilateral uh, level, certainly in Australia's case, once we have finalised the, uh, the FTA with the European Union, that's it, really. Um, uh, you know, Kazakhstan, you know, uh, you know why? Uh, so, so, so we've reached a... We've reached level. Now, one of the reasons for that is that across, across the board, across the great powers and, uh, and, and others, there's sort of little enthusiasm uh, for, uh, for, for uh, free and open trade. My favourite film of 2022 was Everything, Everywhere, All at Once which I thought captured the zeitgeist better than uh, anything else I, uh, I encountered. Adam uh, Tooze uh, popularised the idea of the polycrisis in, uh, in his co columns, the, the, um, uh, the, you know, the perception that uh, systemic crises are engaging us uh, at, at all levels, at the geopolitical level, uh, at the level of the economy, and, uh, and, at, uh, and there is a crisis of the natural order, a crisis of the biosphere. So all those things are coming at us uh, simultaneously. Uh, trade is going to be an answer to all of those things but the way we're framing trade at the moment, the way we're talking about it in, uh, in sort of um, uh, grand uh, uh, narrative terms is almost entirely defensive. Uh, you know, yes, we're going to make trade, um, uh, you know, perform better at the, in, uh, at the environmental level. We, you know, we'll, we'll deal with, uh, uh, with carbon miles to, to whatever degree, degree we can. But, but we are not saying, as we should, I think, that, as Shira Armstrong pointed out uh, at the geo, geopolitical uh, level, um, as uh, Nicole and, um, and Amy uh, talked yesterday as well, others, about, uh, about the, in, the environment, and certainly as New Zealand knows better than almost any other country in, in the world, economically in our capacity for governments to do the things they need to do to, to, uh, to, to support uh, equitable, fair, prosperous societies, trade is the, uh, is the answer. So unless that, we can hammer that home, um, uh, 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 globally, and there's countries like Australia and New Zealand who depend on this more than, more than most uh, uh, can do this, then, we're, th th then the, the cloud of gloom is going to be uh, um, uh, descending on us for longer. Wow. <laughs> okay. Deborah. <laughs> Uh, that cloud of gloom. I mean, you've recently been up in the United States, and uh, I was struck by um, the comments you made earlier there, and obviously um, touching on IPEF and uh, having to change the wheels on, 
on the Boeing 747 while it's flying and building it at the same time and hoping to land it and finding a pilot for heaven's sake, all of that, um, quite a challenge. But how do you see getting that pathway through these turbulent times? And how do we get the US back to where it actually is providing solutions and leadership? Okay, well, if we're going to talk Washington, that is gloomy. I mean, whoa, man, if you go to D.C. these days, it is just like, you know, take the sword and so, de so depressing. So I've always said, thank God I live in Asia and have lived in Asia for so long, because while there are depressing parts of the world, Asia has remained forward-leaning, especially on trade, focused on integration, focused on a collective response to lots of things, um, which is important because we, we can't get out of these crises that you're talking about unless we are do, solving it collectively. Now, of course, the challenge is what do you do if the rest of the world, and particularly if the big players, are not viewing the crisis in the same way and they're not equally keen on leadership and you're caught in the middle? And Of course, there are many of those challenges. But I would say one... There have been a few bright spots in COVID and, and COVID and this disruption that we've had. So tr U.S. China trade war disruption through to COVID. One bright spot for me has been the emergence of middle powers in ways that we didn't see before. And I would put New Zealand, despite your relatively small size and tiny team and MFAT, in that category of designing policies for the future that actually make a difference. And I think that is critical because what we've done in the past is we've relied on big players to decide what needs to be done. They get it done and then you all just say, whatever, we'll do whatever you say and we do it. That's not working. And it, I mean, it wasn't working before, but it certainly isn't working now. And so I think the emergence of, of alternative leadership models from different places and different sources is the only way that you're going to get through the, at least the near term uh, while we sort out this chaos at the leadership level. So I'm really happy, that, that gives me some optimism, because I think about the sort of creativity and innovation that comes from a lot of these middle powers who have been doing this, for, especially on the trade side, for a long time, who have unique models and unique perspectives. Um, I think New Zealand, again, I mean, I'm not just saying this because I happen to be sitting in New Zealand with a room full of Kiwis, but um, I, I think it is a model in many ways. I mean, your trade for all idea is important. That's the kind of idea that's going to resonate going forward with far beyond just this, this country. And so, tr you know, trying to navigate that path is important. And if I were to say to me, how do we deal with turbulent times? I mean, you're gonna have to keep working with, as difficult as they are, the United States. As difficult as China is, you have to work with China. You have to deal with the Europeans. They have very different perspectives, but you have to keep trying to get some kind of cooperative spirit, even if it takes a while. And in the meantime, develop alternative ways of managing ch challenge. And so I think, I think that's important. And I think New Zealand, again, has a fairly good reputation of being pragmatic. And so that, that's helpful because you need to be able to talk with parties that are often at odds to one another. So keeping that pragmatic solution oriented, keep, it feels like banging your head against a wall, I'm quite certain, but keep doing it anyways. Um, and then keep designing policies particularly, obviously, that suit New Zealand, as you should, but also for the region as a pathway forward, I think, is, is critical. Because otherwise, you know, it, it could be a while before this current reset of relations arrives at some kind of more stable outcome. So turbulence, I think, is going to continue. Hopefully, the region can continue to stay relatively stable in an increasingly turbulent space. But it, 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 it's, it is... Um, it is a real challenge. It really is a challenge. And I would say on the trade front, if I can just finish up really quickly, you know, let's, first of all, I would say let's not forget that there are still challenges in traditional trade. You know, so one of the things that is a real problem for trade that nobody wants to talk about because it's totally unsexy, customs. You know, I mean, this is long-standing problems we've had with customs and with tariffs and with paperwork and crossing borders. That gets dropped in the favor of the new sexy, exciting thing. But I would say for trade folks, let's please remember that there are some long-standing problems that you still have to keep working on, like customs. So let's not forget the traditional trade agenda while we're excited about a new trade agenda, because it still matters. And then in the new trade agenda, I think there are actually, I mean, you can view it as depressing, but I view it as maybe opportunities to think differently about some of these looming issues 
um, you know, sustainability is a clear one, but also sort of how do we create more inclusive and equitable outcomes? Um, how do we avoid over-promising? Because the more stuff that you put onto a trade agenda, the harder it is to get anything done. So we have to be a bit, you know, realistic about this. But I think, again, moving that agenda forward and having those, seizing those opportunities where you can is going to be important because it's, I think this turbulence is not a short-term problem. This turbulence is as we reshuffle the global economic order and everything else, it'll be tough. But I think staying flexible and nimble is important. Thank you. Um, Kristen, I mean, one of the, um, one of the fora that New Zealand uh, does have entry to is obviously APEC, and we hosted uh, two years ago, and during that time the Aotearoa Action Plan was established. Uh, we don't, we're not part of the G20, <laughs> we're certainly not part of the G8. Uh, so, I mean, it's, where do you see the role of APEC uh, moving this year, and what can we do to... I guess use that as a bit of a force for stability in these turbulent times. Yeah, uh, thank you for talking about APEC. I'd love to talk about APEC. Um, in short, I think in these times now, obviously things are hard, things that we were doing in the past are not working. And I think there really is a great role for institutions like APEC in helping us to move forward and perhaps create opportunities to make things better, if not for now, because things are very difficult, but in the future when perhaps things will be slightly different. So it is a pretty depressing geopolitical landscape, but I see uh, perhaps a little bit like Deborah, some opportunities to create and maybe engage in some new and creative policy thinking that will actually help us move into a new era and deal with some of these challenges. And I think that's p potentially more important than it's ever been. And APEC as an, an incubator of ideas is a great institution in which we can still think and lay down the frameworks for these ideas for when they do resonate perhaps a little bit more. Um, we'll need them not only to address new challenges, but we'll need them to say, manage the expansion of existing free trade agreements to upgrade them and to move forward in the future. And perhaps on a more sort of technical level, I think a key part of that is perhaps looking at trade in a more holistic way. Um, we see in our free trade agreements, um, a lot of issues are dealt with in various boxes. There's trading goods, there's trading services, there's data, there's digital. But I think what we're seeing now and the way trade is evolving is the interplay and linkages between all the separate areas becoming more important. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to separate out the issues that say may affect digital trade with services or with goods or with customs. So I think there's a real need to look more holistically about how we create frameworks and disciplines that deal with some of these current challenges that we're facing. And if I could just give you a very quick example of one of the projects where we were working on in APEC, which actually looked at the issue of services and marine debris cleanup. So services that are involved in removing plastic pollution from the ocean. And I think, I'll go and explain it, but I think this is a great example of what Alan was talking about, about how we can leverage trade to solve environmental problems. So we flip it, we're not, how do we incorporate all these environmental issues to please everyone in our trade agreements, it's how do we use trade to actually solve some of these problems. So this project we did, the aim was to look at what are the services involved in cleaning up marine debris? What are the barriers to that? And what could potentially be done to remove some of those barriers? So what the study found was in cleaning up marine debris across borders, there were multidisciplinary, I can never say that word, services involved, services providers involved. So we had engineers, researchers, marine crew. There were goods. People need to bring their equipment into these places to clean things up. Beach cleaning equipment, uh, ships to carry people. There was data, because you need satellites to monitor and have access to data to download things. And there were goods, services, and people. Obviously, people needed to move across because they were the services providers moving to provide the services. The barriers also were across services, so they were professional qualifications, licensing and national, nationality requirements, tariffs for affected goods for temporary entry, data restrictions on access, and obviously visa entry requirements affecting movement of people. 
So this is an environmental problem where there are trade barriers affecting the delivery on the resolution of this problem, but they're not in any one box. They're across a whole range of areas. They involve multiple agencies. And if we're going to address this problem and help these services develop up a market and grow, we need to address barriers across all these areas. So quite hard to do in a free trade agreement as it stands, but something that can be done in institutions like APEC where they bring together the, the agencies across government. We can have those deep conversations with the actual regulators that deal with these regulations that impact on these every day. And there is scope then to develop more holistic and whole of government approaches to actually address barriers that matter to business. So to me, that was just, a, I thought, really il illustrated the point that trade isn't going to solve every environmental problem, but there are things we can do in the trade space that are really positive to solve some of these environmental issues. And it doesn't have to be a trade agreement. It can be discussion. It may not result in an immediate access or reduction of barriers, but it can move towards that. And the next step in our project will be actually moving forward to develop up a set of principles that bring together holistically all these different areas of trade that we can put to APEC to say, hey, when you're actually looking, if you want to create a market for cleaning up the plastics, ocean, uh, plastics in the ocean, these are all the things your agencies can do to make that happen. And at the same time, those principles can then feed into broader multilateral processes. So there is a UN process now to develop up a binding treaty on addressing marine plastics. And these principles can go into that process and act as a pathfinder. Mm -hmm. Much the same way the APEC Initiative on Environmental Goods um, did in the WTO. So small steps, but like Deborah mentioned, that constant keeping on going with that, that cooperation, that dialogue and that building across different areas of regulation and government, I think is, is really important. And APEC has a really important role there that both Australia and New Zealand mm -hmm lead in, which is really great. Thank you very much for that, Kristen. I mean, we've heard Vangeli, um, starting with um, Alan, talking about the narrative on trade. Uh, perhaps it's got a little bit um, crowded out by all the other issues today, climate change, indigenous rights, so forth and so on, uh, which we never talked about when um, New Zealand got uh, big into the trade architecture game. So just that, getting back to thinking about how do we uh, play forward that narrative that Alan has been talking about and also see uh, trade as perhaps also a force for um, picking up on the peace dividend and uh, that as well. As, and it's when we go back to how the world global architecture was crafted, I mean, that's where it kind of started. Now, it's how do we get back some of that semblance of, you know, the authenticity and uh, play that forward in tangible ways. A big challenge. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks for the easy question, Fran. That's all right. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, maybe to start with the, the turbulence theme, um, I mean, the previous panellists have all you know, mm. rightly focused on the international part. I think it's worth remembering that, you know, six, seven years ago, it was pretty turbulent domestically too. Yeah. You know, TPP was the subject of significant protests in the streets. Um, bipartisanship was broken, uh, the then Labour Party opposition opposed it in Parliament. Mm. We'd, that, that had never happened um, in New Zealand's history. So there was turbulence at home, um, and I think it's just bubbling away under the surface at the moment. Um, then I think that the turbulence abroad is, is really um, something that we've really got to, uh, to be very, very concerned about for all the good reasons that people have said, and not just on this panel today, but, but over the last two days. I think, you know, the bit that worries me is that this period that I always like to think of as the golden weather for New Zealand trade policy, that period from 1994 into the Uruguay round until about 2015, 2016, um, that we may look back and think that was not the norm, that was the unusual bit. The norm was the, the 80s and before and the post-2016. And that, that really worries me because I think we've forgotten how bad life was for New Zealand exporters before 1994. Um, and how difficult and challenging it is becoming now. Um, so that sort of my observation on the turbulence is that, you know, this turbulence is now here to stay. It's a question of how bad the, the situation is going to get. And I think one thing that we are really, all of us, um, and I've heard it mentioned by a few people today, is the, 
the position of the United States has fundamentally changed. And that is a non-trivial change to the way we've thought about the world and about trade. The fact that the United States, you know, during this, the golden weather for New Zealand trade policy from 1994 until, you know, 2015, 2016, nothing happened in Geneva without the United States' leadership. So all the things that we cared about in agriculture, getting the agricultural export subsidies um, removed in 2015, that did not happen without US leadership. That leadership is no longer there. The thing that worries me now is actually that the United States has now publicly said, as, they, as Ambassador Tai said in December, um, actually, we, we, don't, uh, we just don't think the, the, the work in Geneva is any more uh, of relevance to us. I think that is a very, very big call, um, and the one that really should worry all of us here. So my second observation is, so what do we do about that? And what do we do as a small, and I'm taking a small country perspective here, how do we think about this? What do we, so we, I think we've got to be thoughtful and structured about the way we continue to engage in the WTO, because let's not forget in our excitement around all the free trade agreements, the one thing we don't do in those trade agreements is one of those old, boring things. Um, yes, we do do tariffs and FTAs, but we don't do subsidies. We don't deal with agricultural subsidies. Um, and one of our big challenges fundamentally is there are actually four big subsidisers in the world who account for about 80% of all the trade distorting subsidies. The United States and the EU, who've always been there, and we've got India and China now as major spenders. Um, so, you know, I can't help thinking that for the United States and the EU, at some point there's got to be some discussion about, well, the US and Ch uh, the India and China subsidisation story is now increasing. That is going to have an effect on prices. It is going to have an effect on their... Um, exporters as well, don't we need a system that's going to grapple with that? I think that penny is going to drop, but I think it's going to drop, it's going to take a few, um, a few more years. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, predictably, my answer would be, you know, concerted open plurilateralism. This is the approach that we've been using now for a long time. It's got a venerable history back to P4, um, which then became CPTPP. We're now doing it with a digital economy partnership agreement. Started off with three small countries, you know, if we were simply thinking about a cost-benefit analysis, we'd never have done that agreement. We'd never have done P4. P4 was worth less than a million dollars to New Zealand. Now, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement's worth nothing to the three of us. What's worth it is when you get someone bigger to join you. That's where Korea comes in. So we're hopeful that Korea, G20 member, major digital powerhouse, comes in. So that story of open pluralateralism that we need to run, I think, becomes very important. Um, because you're building... and. The way we think about it is we build these building blocks to support the multilateral system, not to be stumbling blocks. You know, to, I've heard Bhagwati quoted a few times, there's a building block, stumbling block thesis, right? Um, and we are deliberately designing these things to lift, uh, not to go backwards. The, the other elements that we've got in the building blocks that I think are being interesting are the ones that we simply can't wait anymore. So if you think about fossil fuel subsidy reform, one thing we shouldn't forget is that New Zealand, together with Norway, Iceland, Fiji, Costa Rica, you know, group of goody two-shoes countries, um, have started the agreement on climate change, trade and sustainable development. Um, that's using trade in exactly the way you've thought about it. It's using the hard rules of trade to drive reform. The way we used to think about agricultural subsidies and to drive, you know, use a trade agreement to cut agricultural subsidies, that's the approach we want to use on fossil fuel subsidies in a trade agreement. So we're doing the classical things liberalise environmental goods and services, you know, lower the price of so solar panels and, um, you know, environment consultancy services and improve access and so on. But we're doing something very interesting in the subsidy space, which is saying, let's, let's use this trade agreement. People have to commit to reform and they lose the trade preference if they don't, if they breach the agreement. It's not worth much if it's just the six of us. Imagine if you got one or two of the G20 who, year after year, since 2008, have said we must reform fossil fuel subsidies. So that's another part of that building block, right? You've got digital economy partnership, you've got the agreement on cl uh, climate change, trade and sustainability. Um, you've got the indigenous partnership agreement um, that we've got together with Canada, uh, Australia, the United Kingdom and Chinese, not the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom is welcome to join, um, Chinese Taipei. It's that, again, that idea of open pluralateralism to kind of build support domestically, but also internationally to... So th these are the way we try to manage and smooth out that turbulence that really worries me. That brings me to a final observation. I know I've spoken too long. Um, 
there are new areas that we need to think about. There's some old areas, and I would argue that we do need to think much more creatively about the intersection between agricultural subsidies, industrial subsidies, and environmentally harmful subsidies. I mean, if there's ever a moment, surely over the next three to five years, people are going to be interested in having a discussion about what are all these subsidies doing to the climate? Uh, and there's lots and there's more than a decade's worth of evidence from the OECD and others that demonstrates the harmful impacts of these subsidies, whether they're agriculture or indeed industrial. So if you can't have a discussion because you're worried about the domestic protection, let's have a discussion about where it goes in terms of the climate. That's one area. Another area that we really do need to focus on, and um, that's not to disagree with Deborah's point about um, that we need to deal with ta the old traditional tariffs, don't we need some way of gripping up um, non-tariff barriers again? So we've got the TBT agreement, we've got chapters, we've got the SPS agreement, but is there something missing that we can bring that together where a coalition of countries would get together and say, right, we're not, we're going to actually grapple with this and we're going to work together to push them down um, amongst the others. So, you know, if you had a big subsidies, you know, a big sort of, you know, big agreement on subsidies that you pull together a, a, a small but serious group of countries and a small but group of serious country, small but serious group of countries on non-tariff barriers, you're starting to have the makings of a return to multilateralism because sooner or later that's the only way that works. Whew. Deborah, I'm going to invite you to um, put your own lens on that. I saw you listening very intently. I, no, I think, it's, I think that's all true. I mean, I think on the, the last part that you were talking about, you know, sort of innovative approaches, I mean, that's part of what I would suggest IPEF potentially, if we want to keep the Americans in, could do. So, you know, what could you do in IPEF that would be meaningful? Well, we have a lot of rules. We have, a, let me rephrase that. We have some rules on standards. Uh, for food products and non-food products, SPS and TBT. But we don't have a lot, really. And so what could you do in IPEF that would be meaningful, that would be commercially meaningful, that would actually make a difference, that would be new? I would argue, let's think about standards and let's start creating, using the, the APEC process, pathfinders to say, let's talk about, just to pick up a, a micro example, labeling. You know, labeling is actually something that we don't talk about very much in trade, but if you talk to companies and you say, why don't you trade, they will say, part of my problem is literally the label that gets stuck on my whatever it is, is difficult, especially for like food producers. And here's a simple example, even sort of more, more micro, trace ingredients. We have all different rules about what are the levels below which we have to not list and we, we have to list trace ingredients on a label. And because those, those vary, if you're a company and you're trying to export some food product, you know, whatever it happens to be, you have to change up the label in order to list or not list trace ingredients. And you have to have testing to show whether they're there or not and you know, all kinds of crazy things. That's the kind of thing, it seems to me, that makes a big difference. That it sounds micro, but it actually has real world consequences. It affects business operations. It affects consumers, because we could have some consistent rules about you know, trace ingredients or cancer causing whatever. I mean, you could figure out whatever you wanted it to be, where we don't have a platform for discussing it now. So where would you talk about that if you didn't talk about it in a, I don't know what, an IPEF type con con um, place? So I think there is space especially while we are having this incredible turbulence at the top end for, for actually tackling real world challenges like what are we going to do about trace ingredients and labeling. That sounds small, but I do think that's how you make forward progress at a time of turbulence. You have to keep the ball moving by solving one problem after another and showing that cooperation works. We can actually communicate, we can cooperate, things will work. So, that's what I would love to see, and I would love to see, uh, you know, IPEF in particular as a, as a means for this. Now, of course, my challenge, as I, you will recall from my earlier statements today, time is really short. So if you only have three or four meetings between now and when you're due, like, to be able to talk about labeling and trace ingredient, oh, this is too short. But at least you could start maybe something there. You could start it among a group of like-mindeds, whatever. And I think that's the pathway, at least in the near term, is those kinds of practical, hands-on, let's solve a challenge, move to the next one. Uh, that, that's a really important point, Deborah, but um, what about APEC? I mean, wasn't that precisely the sort of thing yeah. that APEC was yeah. uh, set up to do? Yeah, well, this is always an issue, the difference between IPEF and I APEC. I would say you can keep them going, 
the difference would be that the IPEF is smaller, and potentially they could cooperate a bit more because it's, it's only 14, maximum 14 countries as opposed to 21 economies. Maybe you could make forward progress, but that overlap is going to be a, a genuine challenge. But, but it was a problem to begin with, so, you know, what's the difference? Unclear. But I think you can draw, I would say, again, I'm sort of pragmatic, pick the best of whatever from wherever you find it and make it happen rather than say, that's yours, this is mine, that's your silo, this is my silo. Let's figure out what are some genuine problems that we can solve and then hopefully there are also still some smart people trying to figure out how we solve those bigger problems in the longer run, otherwise we're also in trouble. Just, just a quick, couple of quick observations. I mean, on the, uh, regular, on the standards and so on, I agree. I mean, there's been a long agenda on that in you know, a whole range of areas on, not least in FTAs where you talk about regulatory coherence. We just signally failed to actually do that. Um, I think what's really interesting is the CR experience, the mutual recognition approach, and how that's actually worked. And it, that doesn't work for everyone, but it, it does appear to be a more workable model than, for example, the EU's adopt my standard and the rest of you be damned. Um, so that was what, one observation. I, I, I have to admit, I'm, you know, the, the working culture in, in APEC has been very much about using it as an incubator for good ideas. Um, so you mentioned environmental goods. I'd say that you know, in our host year, there was agreement, again, the first intergovernmental agreement on a list of environmental services, an updated list of those. I mean, at some point, um, again, using the environment, the, you know, the natural crisis that we're facing here the, and the urgency of it, that lens being applied, you know, it's clear that the United States is not in the game for an environmental goods agreement because it involves tariff cutting. What about environmental services? What about an environmental services agreement building on the work out of APEC again, which has taken you know, nearly 10 years to get to where we've got to? There's a good body of work. The US has been part of that. The Chinese have been part of that. Is there something there that we can pick up over the next two to three years to say, all right, there is a climate crisis, and here is something that maybe we can, we can find a way into? And if you could, I mean, <laughs> my dream is always how you bring subsidies into that conversation as well. And I mean, this is, this is where, you know, strategic in incrementalism becomes the way you've got to think about it, is these things are going to take time, you build them up, but you use the incubators that you've got, and if IPEF becomes one of those, that'd be great, but right now, APEC is the place that we've got a culture, a working culture of, you know, officials who, who do, are prepared to have those, that confidence building process. And, and APEC has been vital, even in the customs space, if you think about, you know, what we did in ANSFTA, or indeed in RCEP or CPTPP, the origins of that are in the 80s and the early 90s, the work that was done by customs officials and others who built confidence in each other. It's all boring, tedious work. It takes years, but it's absolutely critical. None of the hard rules in the, in the region work without it. Time to stop. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Briefly. Sorry. Uh, Briefly okay. on this yeah. one. Just yeah. to add to all of that, of which I agree, I think APEC, and yes, I'm wearing my APEC hat, is preferable for the obvious reason that it has both the US and China in it. Maybe not cooperating immensely at the moment, but there is great value in that. And I think in the long term, if we're going to look towards developing up regional approaches to address regional integration and given both economies are so integrated into all our supply chains and will remain so for a very long time, despite what they might be trying to do, we can pick up what's best from various forums, but I think there is great value. It's really important that China and the US are both there in the long term, in an ideal world, but just looking long term and optimistically. Um, Alan, I'm interested in the intersection between security and trade, and particularly the Indo-Pacific framework, which um, out of the White House suggestions by Kurt Campbell and others, that this really evolved initially with a security lens, and that the economy and having a framework of consistent values and, and so forth had more of a security aspect to it than hard trade, where you actually do have to do legislation and, mm -hmm. and, um, and not just executive orders to actually achieve real gains uh, for other countries. I mean, do you see that shifting? Do you see it getting more intense? How do you see it playing out? The, the sort of the idea of the debate about the, uh, the Indo-Pacific. Um, oh, as I said, um, I don't know whether it's yesterday or last night, um, you know, the Indo-Pacific is an entirely imaginary 
concept. It's, uh, you know, there's no such thing as the Indo Indo-Pacific any more than there's such a thing as the mm -hmm. Middle East. It's, uh, it's, a, um, it's a term which is used to describe different things. For Australia, I think it makes a huge amount of sense because there you are, a continent with the Indian Ocean on one side and the Pacific uh, on the other, but it has turned into a, uh, into a to, into a normative um, uh, term, the free and open Indo-Pacific, which means not China. Uh, uh, look, I, I, th I don't think it's got all that far to run um, uh, myself because the countries of the Indo-Pacific themselves are so incredibly uh, are so incredibly uh, diverse. So you can't say there's a values issue uh, here when Australia's very good friend Vietnam has a uh, Communist Party government entirely as committed to holding on to the uh, levers of uh, power as the uh, as the C CPP is. So it's it's a uh, if it, it's a shorthand which I think is going to give us uh, be less useful to us over time than than uh, than it has. Mm -hmm. Anyone else like to comment on the security aspect? Well, I mean, I, w I would just say that, you know, sort of what is the challenge? The challenge, as we certainly are aware here, is that the U.S. has no interest in economic engagement, really. It didn't have, a, it didn't have any way to do so, and so then it created IPEF as an economic way to be involved, and, but it's not keen, particularly this administration and even the Congress, not that keen on being economically involved. So how do you square that circle of having to do this but not wanting to? You end up with sort of not ideal outcomes. And, and one way that I describe this to people, which makes sense to me, is that in, in the U.S., the rank order of, of priorities is like security, politics, economics, right? Like it's just really, and Europe is a bit close to that, maybe politics first, then security, then economics. Asia, for the most part, economics, politics, and security. You know, I mean, there's a little variation between them, but where do we have the disconnect is where do we put economics? And so the U.S. is just dumbfounded that RCEP happened, as an example, because they would say, well, how can these countries in Asia, who are so diverse for politics and security reasons, how can they get an agreement done? And it's because economics is important. And because even though, and this is the part that I find kind of amazing about RCEP, in the middle of RCEP negotiations, we had Australia and China who couldn't sit next to each other. But in RCEP, they sat, because it's alphabetical, they sat right next to each other. Korea, Korea and Japan at certain points in the RCEP conversation would not be in the same building together. But in RCEP, again, alphabetically, they're right next to each other for eight years, eight years. So this sort of like, you could sort of park politics and security outside to discuss economics has, I think, served Asia fairly well. Mm -hmm. Now, the extent to which that will continue is a little bit less certain. Um, and I worry that we are breaking down that ability to separate these things, and that will create some challenges. But up until now, we've been able to say in Asia, economics, politics and security, it's not that it doesn't matter, it's just that it's someone else's problem and we can discuss it elsewhere. So we can fight like crazy in politics and security, but in here, it's just economics, let's get, let's get on with it. I hope that that continues. Yeah, it's quite a big, big issue, isn't it? Um, we're going to turn now to what Australia and New Zealand can potentially collaborate on, given that um, this is the topic for this meeting. And we may run out of um, time, I'm afraid, for questions, but I'm sure the panellists will make themselves available elsewhere, unless we're allowed a further five or ten minutes for questions. <laughs> yes, no? Can we? Okay, well, well, we'll go through this and then we'll just take perhaps two very good questions from the floor, no pressure. Um, so um, just perspectives, um, we're, we're coming to um, the 40th anniversary of CER. Clearly, that is quite an ancient agenda. There's been you know, quite a focus on single economic market issues over the last few years. 
But arguably, there are big challenges ahead and there is more combined power in how we think about those challenges globally and in our region. And what are the new narratives that could be crafted and the new policies or even the new questions that might get be addressed by our respective countries, singularly, but also together uh, as we prepare for the July meeting? Any thoughts? Uh, I think, it's, uh, I think it is an enormous opportunity uh, for Australia and New Zealand uh, to force ourselves to, uh, to confront the, uh, the, the times we're in and the difficulties uh, we face and to use our own experience and our own interests as a platform to argue to, or to show, not to argue, to show to others uh, what can be done in this area and how um, and and how trade uh, uh, can help uh, resolve not only the um, not only the economic and political issues but also the social uh, issues that can confront uh, society. So I think I think it's. If, the, if, if both governments are ambitious and on both sides of the Tasman we've got people who seem to be able to speak to each other, which hasn't always been the case in Australia, <laughs> New Zealand, uh, rela uh, relations, uh, let's use it as effectively as we can, not only for our own purposes, but, but for broader international ones. Outside in view, Deborah, what would you say? Oh, oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I mean, I think there are some common interests, and I think the more that you can align, especially from New Zealand's perspective, the more that you can align with those folks who share similar types of interests, the better, you know, clearly. And, and I think both have had a very good track record in the recent years, especially, of working on similar issues, developing that coalition, working potentially collectively on things like, that's again, slightly unsexy but necessary capacity building projects, programming that relies on the expertise of both parties to deliver, especially capacity building in projects, research, exchange opportunities, et cetera. I think that's super important. So the more that you can leverage that relationship that the two countries have together as they work in the region and then more broadly, I think the better both sides are. Because if you want to make a middle power policy that works for the future, you have to work really well with your closest middle power parties, otherwise you're in real trouble. So I think the more that you can align and the more that you can present sort of similar kinds of narratives, the better it will be for both parties, but also for the region and then beyond. Kristen? Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for Australia and New Zealand to lead in some new policy areas, and some of them have already been mentioned, digital, environmental goods and services, the idea of subsidies as well. So I think that can be done through CER. It's a great opportunity for, rather than we can wait on APEC processes and we should continue to work through them, we can work through our FTAs, but what Australia and New Zealand, I think, can do together in common areas and interests is we can be the ones to develop the principles. We can be the ones that then feed into those broader um, forums and frameworks. So I think, sure, it's, it's reactive to a turbulent and terrible time, but it is an opportunity for us to, to be leaders in, this, in new areas. That's positive. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a favourite topic of mine is, you know, what's the future of the single economic market? And... Um, I mean, I think we are coming to the point of diminishing marginal returns. There are some important things that can still be done, but for various reasons, one side or the other doesn't want to do them. Um, but I think one of some, there are still some things we can do. There's the digital piece. Um, I think there's a the green economy piece. I and mean, I'd argue there's also an interesting thing we could do. And again, this goes to the incubator idea that we might do something interesting in, for example, investment. Could we agree that we will not use investment incentives slash subsidies to, you know, attract investors from one side or the other um, to one another, you know, could we set up a sort of a no rating agreement, in other words? So there's still stuff we could do bilaterally that becomes quite interesting then to take out into the world. I actually think the really interesting thing is, though, what, 
what do we really think the future of single economic market is? And I, and I would argue, and here I'm going to now give a personal opinion rather than a New Zealand government opinion. By the way, that investment incentives idea was a personal opinion as well. Um, I think actually what we should be doing, and I'm emphasising it as a personal opinion, that what we should be thinking about SEM is actually the SEM in the world and specifically our region. So the ASEAN Regional Economic Community is underway um, and regardless of how you think how long that's going to take, that is going to happen. Um, and again, if you think strategic incrementalism, surely we should be thinking SEM, Australia, New Zealand, plus ASEAN, um, is the logical extension of the ASEAN Australia New Zealand FTA. So we've got this trade architecture that we now need to deepen. I would also argue that we need to have a responsibility, both of us, for the Pacific, and we need to bring the Pacific into that construct. And the way we start that construct then is to say, well, we have lots of pieces of architecture with Singapore. We both have a lot of architecture with Malaysia. We have quite a bit with Indonesia between us. We have a lot, we have the PESA Plus agreement, which actually goes quite deep in some areas between us. Why wouldn't you also look at Latin America? We've got CPTPP, are there individual, we've got a great partner in Chile, a long-standing partner in doing interesting things. Isn't really our vision for the next 30, 40 years to be thickening up the region through a sort of single economic market concept, the kinds of things we've learned but working with our ASEAN colleagues who are grappling with the same things, they clearly are not going to do what Brussels did to unite the EU. They're not going to agree to one standard for all of them, but the mutual recognition process that we've used across the Tasman may be a model. Again, but isn't that the vision of SEM? Mm. Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> Personal opinion. <laughs> no, good luck in selling that to your, to, to your minister, but, but it is <laughs> remarkably a, um, you know, an, an idea whose time might have, uh, might have come, it certainly would play uh, very well into the views that the new Australian uh, government and uh, the, the, uh, the new um, Southeast Asian envoy, uh, Nick Moore, I don't know if he's come here yet, but, but you know, it's timely, timely, good luck. Okay, time for just two quick questions from the floor. Who's got a burning one? Steph Honey. Sorry for monopolising all the questions. Um, <laughs> look, I was very interested in your ideas. I mean, fully endorse everything you've just said, Vangeli, of course. But um, the ideas that were being talked about earlier of, you know, what are some of the, the fresh new ideas about how we do trade architecture? Is it standards? Is it something in the sectoral, you know, marine plastics debris or whatever? Um, isn't there something about services, you know, I mean, we've seen this slowdown, globalisation in, in goods trade. What are the sort of marginal gains we could expect to see in that part of the global economy? isn't something that looks afresh at how services work, the digital piece, of course, how are they identified, measured, liberalised? I mean, this is the future of the global economy. Shouldn't we be writing some rules for that? Quick answer. Uh, well, well uh, I mean, I like that idea, obviously. And, and I, I think, what, sorry, um, I think, I mean, I would say that, you know, if you could persuade people to use the environment lens and start with environmental services and then do this, that could get really interesting, right? But it's finding a mechanism that brings people together. Um, that's the bit that, that I think I'm still seeking. Sorry? Still seeking, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, is there anyone else who had a quick question? Can I, while he gets his yeah, question together, well, well, yeah. I have one other model that I think would work. I mean, I, I really like the DEPA model, not the content. So put the content to this. I mean, I, I'd like that too. But what I really like about the DEPA model is the modules. I like the idea of a modular approach. And I think you could do something super interesting, for example, on climate and trade in modules. So you could have a module, let's say, on, you know, marine debris. It would be a module within this larger framework, and then you could, you could sort of use this very interesting approach of who joins that module and who participates in it and how you develop that. 
I think that has some real interest that could, and I think this for me is key, bring in a really diverse group of participants. Because you could get, I can imagine, like you could get the Americans and the Chinese potentially on some module within a larger trade and climate agenda that could, again, as the building blocks for future cooperation and whatever, be important, and the topic, of course, is critical. So can we create a climate and trade agenda that is modular based, that gets us further down the path? I think that's super interesting. <laughs> we have something for you. The agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability does, is designed to have a modular thing, yeah. yeah we're not there yet, of course, but. Okay. Just over here, one final question. Kia ora koutou. Um, Could you I, identify yourself? Yeah, can do. Um, kia ora koutou. My name's Kiwa. I'm in the MFAT PDG team, um, working on trade and economic work. Um, my question is, with the single economic market idea, how do you see Pacer Plus feeding into the regional integration, um, especially in the Pacific? Thanks. Um, well, I mean, again, I mean, let me step back and say that's a personal view. Um, I, I, I do think that the connection between uh, the single economic market, the ASEAN regional economic community, and PESA Plus is the one to, to do. So I do see, you know, we may need, I'm going to use the phrase variable geometry, we may need to do it at this different speeds because of the politics of all this. Um, but, but I do see that there has to be, a, the single economic market has got to be all of those. And, and how we do that, I mean, I did talk about a 30-year project. I think that is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But that has to be the vision, because otherwise you just have these trade agreements that they're great, but they only take you so far. And in a world that's getting more and more turbulent, don't we all need, mm -hmm. all of us, little New Zealand, Fiji, which isn't even in PESA Plus, but, you know, Samoa, don't we need that extra thick, thick thickening so that we can manage some of that turbulence together? Together we're, I mean, you know, stronger together. Thank you very much. Um, we've heard a very um, rich conversation this afternoon, and um, I would really like to keep going and to explore CPTPP. Uh, we're going to let China in, how are Australia and New Zealand and Japan going to navigate that? But I guess that's personal views, huh? And you ran out of time. But anyway, um, I would like everyone just to leave us, uh, starting with Alan, with, with just a quick comment that you would like um, a thought well, it's not a thought starter, but something to uh, resonate with, with people here that they may want to dwell on and think on when they leave this conference today. Uh, look, not, not, not trade at all. Um, I wanted to say that one of the privileges of uh, being at the uh, uh, school has been the opportunity to, uh, to meet and interact with so many of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, MFAT um, mm -hmm. uh, graduate uh, cohort. Uh, and all singing and presumably all dancing, if you caught them late at night, um, <laughs> uh, cohort. But, uh, but it really uh, does lead me to just say, um, uh, sorry to have dumped you in the middle of the poly crisis, but I'm, I'm sure you're going to cope uh, perfectly well. I think trade has never been more interesting. I mean, the, for, turbulence is actually good for us. This is the only time in my career that I can recall getting in a taxi and having the taxi driver talk to me about tariffs. They don't, don't, don't even know who I, what I, who I am or what I do, but they just start talking to you about horrible things about tariffs, you know? Like, that never happened for the longest time. Trade just sort of was quiet and under the radar, and now it's super interesting. So, you know, I think that if you're in the space, this is fantastic times. Turbulence is good news for, for careers, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd just like to end with three Cs, important and things I personally have experienced over here in the, in the last two days. Um, cooperation, creativity, and capacity building. So thank you for giving me all three and for demonstrating how you are all amazing at all three. <laughs> Um, I mean, we've had a lot of gloom over the last two days, um, but I think for a small country, the, the turbulence, the, the, the message I want to leave is that, I mean, I do think we all feel, certainly in foreign affairs and trade, that we've still got agency here, and we still have opportunity there to be masters of our own, you know, uh, pathway forward, and there's plenty of interesting things to do here. So it is a great time, as you said, to be doing trade, even if it is a really tough time. 
Thank you. Well, I actually come out of this quite optimistic because I've had two days of quite rich conversation, which I've dwelled on, and I've dwelled on also um, the negativity and the gloom, but through it all has become some quite profound work that's been done, some ways of challenging uh, issues. Uh, also, you know, the um, contribution of the business community, which I, I find really quite interesting, uh, which wonderfully s storms past all the other uh, bureaucratic uh, things and gets to the nub of issues as they affect business, not always correct from the point of view of bureaucracies and official thinking, but I've found actually that clash of perspectives uh, in, an, in a very civil way um, to be um, really rewarding. So I think also I want to thank um, Jennifer for arm twisting us all at relatively short notice <laughs> and um, through the cyclone and through you know the flooding and all the challenges around that, um, for once again bringing this um, you know to bear. And also, I think it was one of your early ideas, Vangeli, as well. So a bit of authorship there about getting this um, school underway. So that's my parting thought. Thank you.